The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Well, welcome to the podcast today. Mondo Gonzalez here with Gary Stearman. Gary, how are you? Hi, Mondo. I'm great. And we have a lot of very interesting topics today. We certainly do. And uh, for those listening, we encourage you to uh, go to our channel and subscribe to us. We're looking for uh, subscribers just to keep the news out there. And our goal is to get you some biblical inf- biblical thinking really is what we're after. We want to think about the current events through the Scripture. I mean, you've been doing that for a long time. Well, a long time, yes. And and, and things are moving faster. I'm sure you've noticed that. Uh, we have an acceleration in world events. Not all of them are things we'd like to see. And which brings up uh, the first thing that we want to talk about today, which is America. America the beautiful. America God shed his grace on thee. You know, we've Mm -hmm. all sung those words. But lately, we're asking ourselves, is America a a post-Christian nation? Because some disappointing things are happening. I think it's a a great question because oftentimes when when I think about America as a post-Christian nation— I look at it in in uh, comparison with Europe. People talk about post Christian Europe and when all that happened. And I think the the real question, I, which I would love to get your thoughts on, Gary, is how do we define uh, America being a Christian nation? We know that the word God does not appear in the Constitution. Uh, the word God specifically doesn't appear, uh, you know, in many of the other official documents. Uh, Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence uses the word Creator. Yes. And uh but there are those that say that America was never a uh, overtly Christian nation in the sense of uh founded upon Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that they were theists. They were deists in that regard. Yes. They believed in God's they, existence. They believed in God's existence. They believe in providence and in in uh, no doubt Benjamin Franklin and others. But so people talk about whether we were ever Christian, but n- no matter what, the the when you go and you see the 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 growth of our country in the beginning, there's no doubt it it became very Christian with the churches and the foundation, the foundational time frame. Certainly, 1600s, 1700s, the, the Pilgrims, the Puritans, etc. So, how do we define if before we say whether it's post? How do we define a marker there? What do you think? Was Christian ever uh, Christianity ever a a compelling? movement in America? And I would say yes. Uh, And I go back in my mind to uh, the days leading up to the Civil War. Uh, The Civil War uh, had a lot of uh, interpretive uh, Christian belief. And you had factions in the South who had one type of Christian belief, factions in the North who had another type of Christian uh, belief. But America's leaders uh, in the North certainly were believers in God. Imperfect as they were, but they were believers, right? Yeah, Yeah, yeah. nobody's perfect. True. And in the South, they had a slightly different approach, uh, a more formal approach to Christianity. And they eventually, after the Civil War, evolved a, a, a sort of a compatibility with the northern states. And from that point on, and I think of like 1865 to to maybe 1948 as a time when we had a Christian ethos in this country, uh, where in government, before people did anything, they prayed about it. Uh, they, they actually uh, had ideas like, would God approve of this? You know, you'd hear people making statements like that or asking questions. I think that began to fade out uh, starting in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and and then with increasing speed in the last three decades. So I think America was more Christian then than it was now. but, But again, how would you put it? Would you say that we were ever a Christian nation. You know, the, that's a great question. We, we were a theistic nation, but I think if that's really, so it's really hard to define because many of the founding fathers um, were, again, were very specific Christian. I want, and, and here's an interesting topic, which, or thought, many people get a little upset, but I think if they do the research, they'll find that this is the truth. Uh, we often talk about Thomas Jefferson as an example, where Thomas Jefferson was not a Trinitarian. 
Right. That, that many of them were Unitarians and they believed in God, but they believed they did they denied the deity of Jesus. And Thomas Jefferson, as an example, thought very highly of Jesus's teachings in the in the in the in the Gospels. However, if you look at his Jefferson Bible and you actually spend the time to research it, it's fascinating to see how he promoted prayer. But in his Jefferson Bible, uh, he cut out things that he he didn't like everything that Jesus said. So he didn't, he didn't just submit. If it's the red letters, then it must be true. You know, you think about Matthew 10, where Jesus tells you to fear God, uh, who can cast both your body and soul into Gehenna. Well, those kind of things he didn't, he didn't like, but certainly loving your neighbor. Uh, he, all the positive things, the, the ethical things that, that the way that he phrased it, he embraced, but he denied uh, the the uniqueness and the deity of Christ, John 1, 1, and other passages. So when you look at the founding fathers, uh, many of them were pastors, but some of them, again, some of them were part of the, of the Unitarian. So th- that's not Christian in the way that we understand acknowledging first and foremost the deity of Jesus or the exclusivity of Jesus in John 14, 6. But it, as we think about well, I think what you you nailed it, Gary. In that, if you look at the early 1900s, that's when we put in God we trust on the on the on the currency. Right. But what I see then is you have this initial religious foundation. There's no doubt we were religious. The, yes. the country was founded re- in a religious way, specifically the way that we understand Christianity. Probably not so much, but certainly a lot of the population was that way. Because it is true, you won't find mention of, of God in, in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or anything else, but we do have the foundation of a creator, which is very Unitarian in the Declaration of Independence. Here's my reaction. <clears throat> After World War I, uh, there was a, a terrible depression in America. I'm talking about an emotional depression, and, and in Europe. And communism began to rise, like Marxism. Mm-hmm. And if you look at what was happening in Russia and China and, and Eastern Europe and so forth after World War I, and then culminating in Hitler, <clears throat> Hitler was a national socialist and certainly was anti-God in, in the most amazing ways. But yet had a form, because, you know, he had a form. A form of godliness. A form of godliness, because, you know, he, he did... Anyways, he leveraged what he could, but yeah, and, his and actions well, clearly were not. <laughs> where I'm moving on this is that after World War I, I think America was a Christian nation. It was a time of, uh, l- let's get moral here, l- and it was a time when whiskey barrels and, and prohibition, right? liquor yeah. bottles yep. uh, d- during the Prohibition era where liquor bottles were being smashed in the streets. And you've, we've yep. all seen the old movies. And there was kind of a, if you, if you can call it that, a uh, <clears throat> revival. Yeah, like a preponderance of revival all through and real. And then I think mm-hmm. there was another revival after World War II. People were so thankful that World War II had finally come to an end. Israel became a nation in 1948. Things began to change in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I think there was a time when America really was uh, – Building churches, building a society, they still taught. In fact, I remember uh, that, that they taught uh, about Jesus in many schools. Yeah. Many schools had textbooks, actually, that, that, that featured uh, Bible quotes. And then that all faded out around the 70s and 80s, and, and it's been downhill ever since. So, yes, America is a post-Christian nation in that sense, but I still believe there are a lot of Bible-believing Christians in America. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, in, in college, I, I wrote a um, like a thesis paper on the separation of church and state, and I think that really is the defining marker of where I see from a national sense. Uh, it was a, a, a decision in 1947 where prayer got was kicked out of schools and that's where you had the phrase the separation of church and state uh spoken by or written by thomas jefferson to the danbury baptist association in 1803 this phrase had appeared in other um, supreme court decisions in a positive sense like oh no the the clearly the original context was people don't realize this that in in the time of the revolution or really the 1800 let's say there were several there were there were 
state religions. You know, you, you might go up to Maine and it would have a state religion, maybe it'd be congregational. You might go down to Virginia, it might be Catholic. So when you look at the original, that's one of the things that I did in the paper, was I looked at the original formulation of, of the First Amendment and there was different uh, drafts. And one of the things that they would say was Congress shall, shall not establish any national denomination, not religion. So really the word religion and denomination were very synonymous back then. And so henceforth, the Danbury Baptists were writing Jefferson, who was president, and they were saying, hey, we're worried that the, the, there's going to be some national denomination that's going to that's gonna put us out. And he said, no, 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 you can't eat the, 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 the First Amendment erects a separation of church and state where the federal government has to stay out of the business of churches. Where so, But in 1947, this is where it changed. They, they turned it, that phrase on its head and said, religion has to stay out of the government. And then that being the case, that's when we started seeing uh, no more Bible reading, uh, no more uh, prayers in schools, which were official part of all the things. You probably remember that. Sure. But uh, one of the interesting things is Jefferson, again, who was a Unitarian, not a Christian as we know it, but he promoted prayer. He promoted National Days of Prayer. He actually, uh, th they paid for the Bible to be printed and be used in schools. I'm not treasury money. So you think about how that couldn't even happen today. There's no way they would pay. So in 1947, once that separation of church and state precedent became, which again was not was unprecedented because the Supreme Court had already ruled in eighteen in eighteen seventies. That's when things started changing. That was the official we're kicking God out, and I think the slide from that moment on led to the sixties and the seventies. And now, as Scripture tells us, uh, many will depart from the faith in the last days. As we approach the end of the age, I would say post forty eight Israel. Yeah. So that decision in forty seven and Israel becoming forty eight is very interesting. That's a signal date. You know, the one thing that uh, we rarely talk about, and that is that uh, Christianity has enemies. As you were talking, I was thinking about this. Uh, the enemy is always trying to unseat anything stable in Christianity. Uh, societal st stability uh, in particular, and the relational uh, instability, getting one faction against another faction. And the Bible from cover to cover is full of the idea that we have an enemy who is very, very busy. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And you and I take that for granted. In other words, it's true. It's real. And the enemy really is working. And we are working against the enemy. So the, the idea of whether or not we're a Christian nation, it, it sort of depends on how successful we're pushing against the dark side, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think if we, if we were to look at it from a, a, from a government perspective, again, from 1947 on, it just it took time for the, the government uh, to, to, to change the way that they view things. And um, the other thing that you saw was them – the government, the Supreme Court, through other amendments, now sta stating, taking the First Amendment, which the Congress shall not establish any national right. religion, to say that applies to the state governments as well. And so now it became illegal for all the states to have any sort of national or state religion, which, again, they did. If you look at history, it's it's, un it's undeniable. But I think in addition, Gary, if, we, if today we ask the question, is America a post-Christian? Absolutely. Not only because of that, because America, uh, religion has become uh, cursed in, in, the, in the governmental stages, not only federally, but through the states. But secondly, if we look at the society or the church, if we start looking at the seminaries and the colleges, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, all these were originally established to train uh, pastors to preach the gospel, to see all of them I would say really from 1860 on with, with evolution and Darwin, uh, all those things now infiltrating enlightenment, infiltrating into the seminaries. Now the seminaries, they're not, they don't believe the scriptures, uh, the, the literal word of God like we do. It's not inspired. And so now the churches, now here we are, we're watching the churches truly abandon official or uh, historical Christian doctrine. And so between the government and the churches that we have, are we post-Christian? I would say absolutely. Well, to put it in the language of the street, as someone once said to me, Christianity ain't cool. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is too true it, to, to say you're a Christian. I think the other interesting thing is for you and I, I – 
people say, are you evangelical? I go, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Now, I, I, I know what evangelical originally meant in theological circles. It was a very specific term. It had nothing to do with evangelism. Evangelical was about whether you took the scriptures being yeah. inspired and inerrant and for the all, it was the guide for life. Um, now today, evangelical has been hijacked really back in the 90s by, yeah. I would say, even the religious right. I'm not speaking negative about that. But now it's become a political term where it, it wasn't. It was a theological term. Very true. Very true. We fight the good fight. Uh, and the fight's always going to be there. You look at the entire church age, it has been a struggle. And, and, and as the Lord speaks to mankind— he addresses us in uh, in that sense that be strong, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Well, why do we have to be strong? Well, because we've got an adversary, Absolutely. and and that's the way it is. Post Christian, uh, I'm not sure I'm completely willing to say that at this point in time. Yeah, that's you have more you have more faith than I do, Gary, in that regard. I mean, I think for us, at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything whether whether we. Uh, officially have arrived at a post-Christian. It doesn't matter because yeah. what we know is that the Scripture tells us, again, many will depart in the end. But as long as we're here, we're, we're to occupy until until He comes. And so the goal is to preach the gospel, to share. God is not willing that any should perish. And He's, uh, you know, quote, quote, waiting, not that God can wait. But in, in our sense, God is, is delaying His second coming because— he wants more people to be saved, and so we we have our orders. We have our and and I'm not I'm not discouraged. It just makes it makes us realize that when you go out and you talk to somebody about Christianity, you have to start at square one. They don't have most Americans now don't have the foundation. I mean, they think Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. I mean, we can give a whole bunch of, uh, <laughs> of fun little things of you know Moses and and basic biblical literacy is is horrible in the church in the general church. How, and then if you if you were to extrapolate that to the rest of the average American citizen, they have no clue. So when you come, that's an, another, I would say, another marker is that 100 years ago, you could talk to somebody. They would have a basic biblical framework because they were learning it in school or whatever. People have no idea about God or the Gospels or Old Testament, New Testament. It's amazing. Well, I think to bring this uh, discussion to the place that I'd like to really focus on— uh, I really would like to see the power of Christianity, that is, uh, the ability that it has to come in and, and change society for the better. Absolutely wonderful power, illustrated by several uh, great awakenings in the past. And by the way, people who, who, who were living in far worse environments than we are now, uh, the power of Christianity has manifested itself time and again. Not permanently. It, it didn't come to power to stay in power. It always got knocked down again, but Christianity always bounces back. And I'd like to think that we're in a bounce right now, that, that you and I uh, are among millions out there, perhaps, yeah. who want to see this, this power yep. manifested. I think that uh, God always has the remnant. This is the doctrine of the remnant, and you know we can kind of end this topic here. The reason we're talking about it is, if you're listening, is just— we're talking about prophetic events, and the scripture yes. tells us that, that many will depart at the end, and it's it's a sign of the end of the age, uh, as we see the the departure. But on the other hand, here we are. I mean, we we know that the our goal is to to reach the remnant. God God is working on that, and as we stay busy, we're going to reach every last person that we can. We're going to be encouraged. We're going to trust in the power of God. Paul said that in Second Timothy two ten. Why do I endure all these hardships for the sake of the elect? That they too may obtain salvation. So he's out there getting beat up, you know. He's he's getting shipwrecked because he's out there preaching the gospel. He, he at the time he wasn't trying to win the whole world for Jesus in that sense, or that was he was just saying I'm out to reach the people that the remnant. That's what he was after. And so a good good topic. Uh, I think Gary, th th this th this leads us into another topic if you don't mind, because the we here at Prophecy Watchers we love to talk about the f some of the fun things. And uh, some of the st strange things, and, and UFOs are one of them. And there was a report that came out just this past uh, couple weeks about a whistleblower. Uh, his name's David. David, what, I'm trying. To, David Grush. And uh, let's talk about that. What did this guy? What's this guy saying? 
Well, what he's saying is, uh, I think as he makes a statement which, uh, once spoken, cannot be retrieved. It's one of those things now that, like your dad said, now I mean, be careful what you say, if you if, because once you say it, it's said. And, and the statement we're talking about here is there is someone who is a formal, former intelligence official in the U.S. government who is saying that we as a nation possess retrieved, intact, and partially intact craft of non-human origin. And I, that's end quote. Now, that's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. <laughs> I think the, what people need to understand is, again, our goal— is to address things from a scriptural perspective. We've, right. we've talked about UFO, UAP. I want to talk a little bit about that as well. But, you know, back in, in, in 2021, or back in 2020, they had the UAP task force, and then that got trans transitioned over to the to the all-domain anomaly resolution often, or ARO, in July of 2022. So not even a year ago. So there's no doubt the government, Congress by congressional order, has has established these offices in order to research and to evaluate and to increase the 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 conversations between intergovernmental agencies the communications but this guy this this David he he is part of the inside group now of these organizations. He, he was part of the task force as well. So here you have now people that uh, this guy's a, a career veteran. He's a career a military guy. And he gets assigned to be a part of these task force to research. And, and now, he comes out to say, hey, this information is not getting to the Congress, which it was supposed to be. And so he comes out as a whistleblower here just a few weeks ago in saying what you just said, non-human craft. Non-human craft. Now, if they're not human, who are they? Uh, I'd like to throw in something that, that here of a nomenclature nature. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've talked about UFOs for years. <clears throat> and then we started talking about uh, UAPs, you know, un unidentified uh, aerial f phenomena. Now we've changed it a little bit more with uh, Mr. Grush. Is it Grush or Gr uh, yeah, yeah, Grush or Grush? David Grush. What? Our apologies. But yeah, to, exactly. To Mr. Grush. Uh, now we are calling uh, these things that are flitting around in the darkness, uh, and people are reporting them, I think, with increasing frequency. We're calling them unidentified anomalous, not aerial, unidentified anomalous phenomena which suggests that they don't necessarily come aerially. They come anom <laughs> anomalously. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you can't put your finger on them. You, you can't categorize them. They have their little uh, uh, bits of, of light that, that, that come in the darkness and whoosh, and you see them for about three seconds, and they're gone. And they are anomalies, and we're still trying to put a label on these anomalies, but uh, the government has now chosen that title, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Being Piloted by Non-Human Beings. And the, uh, the un <laughs> unbeatable idea that comes out of all this is that we have talked with some of the people yeah. that are flying these machines. This, this is absolutely... That officially, the government in the past, you wrote about this in Project Jehovah, great, great article. The government has actually talked with these other beings yes. officially. This, yes. is, this, is, this, is, this is what I think is fascinating about this guy's comment. He's on the inside. He's whistleblowing. <clears throat> I also, I would love to comment on the, 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 the name and the, the, the change in the nomenclature as well, because... When they went from UFO, which began 60, 70 years ago, everybody knows in, in the modern parlance of what UFO looks like or means. It's a disc, whatever. It's something physical, Roswell crash, blah, blah, blah. But I think even there, as soon as they changed it to phenomenon, a phenomenon, the very word phenomenon is the idea of a perception. 
It's not real. Oh, look at that phenomenon. It's something that you are perceiving through your physical senses. Uh, but you could be, yeah. it could be a light in the sky, which doesn't mean it's physical. So now by them changing it to phenomenon, they're, they're automatic. That's a subtle thing. And then, as you said, then to add in anomalous is another subtle removal from hardware. I mean, something. So now you had not only with, um, phenomenon language but then you have right. anomalous phenomenon and you're like okay really there's nothing here guys uh you have the denial this is just simply your perception it's something that you're seeing with your with maybe some some orbs or whatever you're seeing on the, uh, a, a, a dust mode on your camera lens blah 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 so what i find fascinating is <laughs> gary do you trust the government the pentagon to be fully forthright in everything they're saying uh, let's see. Do I? No. No. <laughs> I don't. And the reason for this is that they are going to milk this phenomenon for all it's worth. And, and I believe we've reverse engineered. Which is uh, what he claims in uh, here. Yes. He, he claims, claims that, it. Yep. that. We have crashed several crashed UFOs. He actually makes that statement. We have some of, some of them are fragments. Some of their entire vehicles, the way he phrases it. And, and much of what they are has, has over the years, and we're talking about decades now, been reverse engineered. And a lot of our high-tech stuff is coming out of the, that reverse engineering. Uh, now, that's not a an anomalous phenomenon to me. That is, that's hardware. That's hard. Yeah, that's that's fact. I mean, this goes back to, and you, I'm sure you you know about all this and talked about it, is, goes back to the 90s with Bob Lazar, you, you yes. know, working at, at uh, down in Nevada at, and, and working on doing the reverse engineering as a physicist. So here's a guy that's 36 years old. He's, he's a decorated veteran. He has, um, you know, impeccable integrity, according to the witnesses that yes. know him. So for him to come out is very... Uh, very dangerous, very risky for him. But he's like, no, Congress needs to know what, what is going on here. Now, you know, we can go into a lot of the details. Uh, people can go to the debrief. This is the, the, one of the main articles that came out was the debrief uh, website, uh, the debrief, the debrief.org. But let me ask you, let's, let's, let's just, let's take what we have right now, Gary, because I want to ask you some theological. Let's switch to theology for a minute. Okay. Okay. The average Christian doesn't necessarily follow all this. Our goal, you and I both as pastors and teachers, has been to try to guide people always. Matthew 4.4, 4, we live by the word, right? The word is central. So here we have, let's just take what he says as absolute fact, okay? Just for the sake of argument. Craft, pilots that are non-human. Theologically now, does this ruin your faith? Not at all. <laughs> but, but it does beg the question, what do you mean by non-human? Uh, <clears throat> would, would these be what we would call spirit beings? Well, let's say that they're flesh. Like they, okay. they're in the flesh with their hard, with their in the flesh ship, you know, disc. This is, this is made of metal that had to be mined somewhere. It's not just an illusion in the sky, yeah. right? So where'd the metal come from? It had to be mined somewhere and it you know, had to be fabricated by physical something rather who's, who are piloting. And so, Mr. Grush actually says that uh, we have partial fragments uh, of intact vehicles. Now, that's a, a quote in this article. And, and when he's saying that, he's, he's talking about a vehicle that carries non-human entities, and he talks about vehicles. And he talks about having parts of crashed vehicles and also total intact vehicles. Obviously, these have been reverse engineered. Obviously, given decades now of, of uh, people, ordinary men on the street, looking up, seeing one of these things come down and land, and then it takes off and disappears. Or it may be hovering, and suddenly, poof, it just winks out and goes somewhere else. And when you think about this, what are you thinking? Are you thinking um, a spiritual being? Or you think about somebody from another galaxy, or what are you thinking of? And I have thought about this for years, and I come down on the side of what the Bible would refer to as, as spiritual entities. That is to say, they are entities 
capable of altering their uh, disposition. So that they to, be, to be physical. We obviously know that from Genesis 6. Yeah. They could take on corporeal bodies, no no problem. We see that in, in not only Genesis 6, but Genesis 18, the two angels that appear to Abraham, they're with, with the Lord, they're eating. Then they, in, in chapter 19, they go to Sodom and Gomorrah. I think what we, what I, what I will not do is just, it's too easy to say, oh, they're just demons. Well, I, I, that's to me that's so that's weak because a demon is a non-corporeal spiritual being that's looking to be embodied. We're not just dealing with a light in the sky where maybe you have a, 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 a an, an, see this is see this is where I think the government is tricky because I think the average average Christian might say, oh well, it's not physical. It's just a phenomenon. So they're going right. to buy into the government saying, say, no, it was just a light in the sky. There's nothing physical about it. But what we're saying now as Christians, we have to come to grips with this idea that this is not just a, a, a non-corporeal spiritual demon. This is actually a real craft that was put together and fabricated somewhere with, with real material that we are able to reverse engineer. See, to me, this takes it to a whole nother level of as a christian to say okay now i'm not saying gary that we have all the answers or even that the bible specifically is going to reveal all of the answers to who these who these other beings might be where did the craft come from did it come from another galaxy uh, in in my mind i would say maybe it did does that bother does that ruin my christian faith no we do know that there's um again the angels that are there uh, good angels bad angels but uh, where, where did this craft come from did it was it mined was that hard material did it come from another solar system or whatever possibly does that bother me no it doesn't bother me at all because the bible doesn't give us all of the answers as it relates but the that's that's the one question but the second question is who are they and what are they doing and what's their message well, I take the biblical view, as you know, they are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, talks about a man who went into another dimension. And Paul speaks of four dimensions, length, width, breadth, and height. And it, he just tosses that off like everybody knows it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, but he, he also talks about having gone to a place in another dimension, which he was forbidden to speak of when he came back. And he called it the third heaven. And so we know that there are other dimensions, and we also know that there are renegades within yeah. those dimensions. The Bible is very, very um, persuasive in telling us about the history of man on earth. And uh, there are evil, rebellious sons of God uh, who have quite a history in the Old Testament. And they were able to manifest themselves to human beings and then disappear. And we have many, many instances of that in Scripture. And so I've always taken that view of what these quote-unquote UAPs are, UFOs, whatever you want to call them, unidentified objects are uh, like the ships who appeared to the prophet when the enemy was coming. Suddenly, a prophet was given a vision and he could see uh, ships on his side flown by angels who were going to defeat the enemy. That's a Bible story. And you have ships that manifest themselves. So do I believe it? Yeah, sure, I do. It's in the Bible. And that then that phenomenon of being able to move into our dimension and move out of it is biblical. I think that I agreed, Gary, because when if you read the book of Hebrews, uh, or even even in the book of Revelation, there is a literal, I mean, there's a literal, I would even say physical uh, ark in heaven. There's a literal physical temple in heaven because we know from the book of Hebrews and even from the book of Exodus that Moses patterned the, the earthly tabernacle after the physical and literal one in heaven. Uh, it even mentions the ark being seen. It mentions an angel going over to the to the to, to getting some incense and and, th and throwing it to the earth. And so we have a, a throne. So I think oftentimes as Christians, we are very um, limited or narrow in our views that we think, oh, there's nothing else physical anywhere in the universe. Well, how, we don't know that. We don't know what else is physical in heaven. Uh, we, we just assume that angels are are just flying. There's no there's no verse in the Bible that 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 as that it says that angels 
were flying with their wings. We know, know that cherubim and seraphim have, have wings, but they have six wings. But in the sense of flying from outside of our, our earthly atmosphere, uh, where the angels, you know, they get dispatched, Gabriel gets dispatched from God down to earth. Uh, we, we don't know. We're, we're limited. That's all I'm saying is that. Yeah. But there's hints in the Bible, as you mentioned in 2 Kings 6, talking about chariots of fire and all that those mean. Were, were they literal or spiritual? I think they were cloaked. Because his uh, the eyes of the servant in 2 Kings 6, his eyes were open to see these 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 uh, chariots, the Merkava, Merkavot, right? Th they, were they physical? I, I tend to think that they could be, but they were cloaked in some way. Yeah, or able to merge into another dimension. Right. You know, I, I think of Ezekiel's wheel, you mm -hmm. know, when it landed, and there's this incredible description of it in the Bible, which many people have tried to imagine, but it's way too complex. It's above our <laughs> ability, and yet I... With all my heart, I believe in the reality of that vehicle, which was uh, flown by the Lord to Ezekiel, manifested itself. And if we believe Scripture, Ezekiel was even taken aboard this and given a ride. And he described uh, a force pushing down on him when it took off, which I've experienced yeah. in airplanes. Yeah. G-force. Yeah. G-force. And so, to me, as, the hand of the Lord was upon him. So that's that's kind of that's the imagery. Yeah, yeah, the the, the pushing down, mm -hmm. and and he also heard sounds emanating from from this vehicle. So, as a Christian, there's no problem at all for me to uh, imagine that such a vehicle exists. Neither is there a problem for me to imagine the dark side, and it also possesses such vehicles. Yeah. And they use their vehicles for very, very dark things that we read about. I mean, how many books have been published in the last 50 years on UFO abductions? Yeah, that's, that's by the dark side. Yep. And who are the abductors? See, that, that, let's, let's, let's summarize <laughs> this because, you know, as, as more and more information, I don't trust the government. Uh, you know, this whistleblower, I'm not saying I trust him 100% either. But what, what we do know is that there has been an agenda within modern culture with all of the the movies and the media and and, and the films marvel you, you, yeah. to 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 create uh, a thought a, a mindset in, in the minds not only of 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 people but also especially the young people so as we come and we try to understand the nature of a great deception that second Thessalonians 2 describes we have to come and say hey if if a, if a, if an alien ship that according to this guy, a physical ship, if that physical ship showed up tomorrow, and as we've you mentioned or you wrote about in, in the Project Jehovah, that there's been this agreement by these non-human entities, physical non-human entities with governments around the world. This isn't just this is global. He mentioned that too, that this is global. Does it go, oh my gosh, the Bible's wrong? Not at all. What what the real question? See, again, we just say, hey, the Bible doesn't give us all of the answers, God says he there's there's mysteries that he re holds to himself. But we what we do know is fact. Jesus is the only way. So again, I always joke that I want to go up and shake their hand and say, "Oh wow, look at you! You got a handshake." Uh, one question for you: Do you believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, and salvation is found only through Him? That's a yes or no question. Yes. Don't, don't spin me. You know, so w when we ask these, these questions, it'd be like, well, I was your creator. No, that's not, I don't care about that. Do you acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah? And that is the determining factor. And I think for the most part, the average person, we just talked about a post-Christian America, the average American out there, th they're not going to think that way. So for no. them, this <clears throat> deception, this del delusion that's coming, could it be connected with some sort of massive amount of malevolent deception? You, you mentioned uh, abductions. There's been, I mean, John Mack and Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, Carla Turner, all these, these PhD people, they've done research on this. What we do know, what I imagine is good angels are not going to come down to deceive humanity. These, these are malevolent. That they're, they're bad in some way, but we don't have all the answers. Well, let me just quickly say that, that what you're describing sounds like what we've always called the supernatural. <clears throat> In other words, supernatural being something beyond a dimension as the devil and his angels and the, the good angels of the Lord. And there are these celestial battles that have gone on in the past 
They're going on right now, I believe. And uh, there is a battle in the heavens, and there is another dimension above us. The Bible is very clear about that. And there is a contest to see who can win human souls. And um, Christians, I think, you know, evangelical Christians, people who are out there wanting to spread the gospel, uh, understand that there is a, a, a dim dimensional, hyperdimensional battle that sometimes bleeds through into yeah. our dimension, and we see it maybe in the form of UFOs at night for just a few seconds, and pop, it's gone again. But maybe it chooses to manifest itself uh, as something metallic. Yeah, physical. Mm -hmm. Physical. Mm -hmm. And it has done so, and if if the the information coming out uh, from, the, from the government is true, They've got the parts and pieces to prove that, that whatever these things are on the other in the other dimension, when they come into this dimension, it's possible for them to crash and burn. Yeah, they, see, that's the key. And I think as we end this segment, uh, people, as you, if you're a Christian, I would just encourage encourage people that don't 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 buy into the deception uh, right. of what they. Um, what they could or couldn't be, or that, that there are saviors, there are creators, progenitors, whatever. But on the other hand, don't deny it either. I don't. I think Christians shouldn't put their head in the sand and go, "No, it can't be true. It can't be true." The Bible would say, "Well, hold on a minute," because in Daniel ten, we get this. We get little glimpses. God gives us enough to say, "Hey, there's more. Be humble. There's more behind the scenes than you realize." That the angels is dispatched to go to Daniel, but yet he's he's hindered by another evil angel, an evil prince. And he says, I had to call Michael's help to come help yeah. me. And so Michael comes. And so it, the, the thing for me is th this fighting, this hindrance, it was a, it was a, it was a spatial location. He was dispatched from heaven to come down to physically be in Daniel's presence, but he was physically hindered for 21 days. Yes. Right? Until he got reinforcements from Michael. So this isn't a figurative battle. This is a literal spatial battle. Uh, when we go to Revelation 12 and we see Michael and his angels fighting against Satan and his angels, is this a figurative battle? Or are they just having a spiritual figurative? Or is it real? Is it somehow physical, behind the scenes, interdimensional, behind whatever, kind of what we saw in 2 Kings 6? So I just encourage people, yeah. hey, at the end of the day, the Bible does give hints of this. And there's so much that we don't know. We're not here claiming to know, but we know enough to recognize that there are these physical things behind the scenes. You know, I have to say something right now because it's, it's just bursting out of me. Uh, secular man, men who do not believe in the Lord Jesus as Savior or the Bible or whatever, have attempted to crack the code on, on uh, the things we're talking about by writing science fiction. Science fiction started back in the 19th century and then in the beginning of the 20th and up to the middle of the 20th, it was just, it boomed. Everybody knows about science fiction and Star Wars. Uh, a uh, satellite physicist, a, a, a man of, of mathemat mathematician, became a sci-fi writer. His name's Arthur C. Clarke. He actually helped to design systems that became satellite systems, but he, he wrote a book about <clears throat> a vehicle like the one we're talking about that landed on planet Earth, and it carried a Savior. And this Savior had spoken with man by long-distance radio for a long, long time before the craft landed. When it finally landed and he stepped out, guess what? He, he had a red skin, strange eyes, and a forked tail. And Arthur C. Clarke is raising the question, who are these people? That are coming. I mean, in his sci fi way, he was asking a biblical question. Yeah. And the Bible answers it. Yep. I think when we, it comes back to, that, again, that ultimate question I don't care who, who you are. Paul said it in Galatians 1 I don't care if an angel from heaven comes, yeah. if he comes with any other gospel, chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, any other gospel, let him be anathema than that which Paul preached. And that is the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the Savior, the Creator Himself, uh, the one who came down uh, in the flesh. Because uh, again, the spirit of the Antichrist denies that Jesus came in the flesh. So it's a denial of Jesus, no doubt. So as we think about the future and as we think about what's happening, uh, one of the, the 
biggest things as we see uh, in, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said it, Paul said it, John said it in the book of Revelation, that deception, make sure that no one deceives you. And the only way that we're not going to be deceived through all of this information, I mean, this is, this is powerful information here by a whistleblower. And again, I'm not saying that he's right, but even if we take it as fact, it doesn't bother my faith because we are rooted in the foundation of these of these scriptural principles, but also that scripture does teach about these other crafts, these other Merkavot, these other chariots, whatever that looks like, Ezekiel 1, 2 Kings 6. Um, we well, just you go. Know, Arthur Clark <clears throat> titled his book, Childhoods and, with the idea that at some point, humanity is going to see the stark truth when that individual steps out of that ship and it's realized, wait a minute, this may be the enemy who has been presenting himself to us. As an angel of light. As an angel of light. And that is so biblical. Yeah, I think, Gary, you and I, I mean, this is going to be fun to watch because we, you know, we've been watching for years, but really from 2017 uh, with Fox News and Tucker and others, it's becoming like every few months now we get more information of especially what L.A. Uh, Marzulli talks about, the disclosure. You know, we've done f films where we're on the ninth rung of the ladder. Well, I was talking to him last <laughs> week, and he's like, I think we're on the 18th rung now, you know, because <laughs> disclosure, which has been yeah. um, really predicted for a long time, we're, we're living in it. This, this is the soft disclosure that's coming out because you hear you have a whistleblower coming. You have the official Pentagon narrative denying it, going, well, this guy, but yet he's got incredible integrity and credentials, um, testimony from people. The Congress is going, well, wh what's the real truth? And also, if you bring in, there's no doubt, the black ops uh, of other things, the military black ops, they have a, a desire to keep this information from being known because it is a national security issue, not only for what they can do to us, but also what we've accomplished on our own in the re reverse engineering. How much have we done? Do, are we going to, you know, let our let our cards out? Don't get me started. I, I have made a study of this over the years, and, and reverse engineering has brought us everything we call high tech, including what's morphing into AI, yeah. which is very scary, by the way. And uh, I want to read a sentence, and, and this would be a, a good way to bring this to a close. Jonathan Gray is a generational officer of the United States intelligence community with a top secret clearance who currently works for the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, where the analysis of UAP has been his focus. Previously, he had experienced uh, serving. Private Aerospace and Department of Defense Special Directive Task Forces. He's way up there, and he says, the non, and this is a quote, the non-human intelligence phenomenon is real. We are not alone, he said. Retrievals of this kind are not limited to the United States. This is a global phenomenon. We're talking about the Chinese, the Russians, mm -hmm. people all over the world. They're getting little bits and pieces. It reminds you of, of the, the story that you read <laughs> in the book of Enoch, where a group of angels came down and gave technology to man. You remember that? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Is it happening again? And he says, this is a global phenomenon, and yet a global solution tends to elude us, he said. That's where we are. It sounds so much like the things mentioned in Bible prophecy to me. It really does, Gary. And as we, over the past few years, we've seen the trend, I mean, the word global. When, when, I, when I see things that are globally affecting uh, the entire planet, you know, whether, even whether it's COVID or, or anything else, you know, regulations, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. I tend to think this is this contributes to the end of the age scenario. Yes. Now, as a preacher person, uh, we don't know how far how, how far along when the rapture is going to happen. How much of this we'll be able to navigate along, or whether it's going to it, it's not going to totally appear after we're gone because it's already appearing now. Right. So it's setting the stage for when the rapture does take place, and for potentially there to be a alien type. It, will the Antichrist be connected somehow with the with an alien idea or a non-human? What well, this guy says, this this guy's saying it. So the, the stage is being set. I think let's end it here in the sense yeah. of as a Christian, uh, this is exciting. 
because, and it doesn't hurt our faith at all. We come no. back and we go, no, there's hints of it all throughout the Bible. And at the end of the day, we recognize this is contributing. We, we are going straight. I mean, like oh, the, the slope, I like to run hills, and but the slope is getting f steeper and steeper as it comes in that certainly faster and faster to the end game. I would just ask you one question, rhetorical question, Mondo. <clears throat> You've read, have you read, I'll make it a question, have you read Re Revelation? Well, of course you have. And what do you see after the opening of the seals? You see all kinds of strange creatures rampaging over the earth and m making an, an absolute misery of, of the surface of planet earth. And you think, well, where did they come from? Well, my goodness, it's like almost like sci-fi. They almost came from outer space or something like that, except we're talking about the Bible, and we're talking about something that's in our future. And you and I, I think, both believe we're seeing a, a bit of a foreshadowing of the things to come. Absolutely. You know, Gary, this has been a great conversation. You know, it's it's here we are. Good podcast. <laughs> so for those listening, appreciate you listening as well. And, uh, you know, keep watching, as Gary likes to say, because there's a lot going on. Things are happening on, a, on an almost daily basis. Yeah. And uh, subscribe to the channel. We'll continue to keep you informed from a biblical perspective. Mondo, it's been great. Thank you. Amen.